developing high performance computing systems, supercomputers for Department of Defense, Department of Energy, and, uh, and for NASA, and specifically JPL. And uh, narrowly escaped with my life and decided that if I returned to the sciences, it wouldn't be as a salesperson, but as a researcher, and I'm on that path now. I spent the last three, three and a half years doing business development um, for clients around the world, and I'm now, as I said earlier, going to be um, engaging in a uh, graduate level research program at uh, Cape Town University in South Africa. And this is really the beginning of my, uh, my research starts this fall. And uh, these are the questions that I'm asking, and I'm hoping for a certain level of engagement from you. Um, as I present the basic concept, I'll come back to you and see what kind of input and ideas you have, and I hope it's, uh, it's fun in that respect. So the basic question is, in that time when we're literally building, and I assume we will be building a colony on Mars, why would we do it all over again? Why would we do it the same way? Why would we just go and reproduce what we have here on Earth? Some of it works, some of it doesn't, uh, but what can we do better? So I'm going to tell you a brief story. Um, two years ago, I was on the East Coast working on uh, the beginning of a documentary film about astronomy and how astronomy instills a passion for the sciences. And I just finished uh, shooting that uh, with the primary, with a month of primary shooting in South Africa. And I was uh, stuck in one of those awkward moments where I hadn't scheduled a hotel room. I didn't really want to stay in a hotel. I wanted to camp. I was in New Hampshire. And I was driving around with the West Coast mentality of, oh, I'll just pull off on a side road. Um, there aren't side roads, and there aren't really National Forest Service roads like there are in the West. So I ended up in a Good Sam's campground. If you've ever been to a Good Sam's campground, it's uh, a crowded, rather interesting place. There is a diversity of people. There are $50,000 RVs for people who have just pulled in for a night or two, and there are people who have literally been there for years who somehow establish permanent settlements. And they have little picket <laughs> fences and gardens, and their kids are running around. Their kids are growing up in a campground. And at first, I was completely dismayed coming from the West Coast and anywhere, you know, even in Colorado, where you have relative endless space for yourself. And here, you could barely park, let alone get out of your car without bumping into somebody. And yet, this was home. And there was a turning point for me where instead of being frustrated and thinking, how am I going to get out of this place, I actually saw it as an isolated example of a diverse, a diverse set of humanity. We have everybody from the people who just arrived in their very expensive RV and are traveling across the United States to the people who call this place home. And I thought back to some of the science fiction I've read from Arthur C. Clarke and Asimov. Maybe this is an example of how people from many different walks of life actually get along. What if our colonies on Mars are something like this in the future, past the point at which we just have the super scientists and the, and the astronauts going, at the point where we have the rest of us? So those, that's the beginning of the, of the story for me. Um, and so my question is, you know, when we start again, um, what questions, and I have, I have a number of questions, but what questions can we ask instead of trying to say, well, let's design utopia. We know that's not going to work. We have humanity that will always catch up with us. We're a xenophobic species. We're very complex, um, usually emotionally somewhat unstable. And so to actually believe that we can proactively design something is probably not quite right but to believe that we can at least curb our appetite for some of the behaviors that we've seen here on the Earth. I'm hoping that by asking the right questions, we can proactively design an environment in which we do a little bit better than we might have done here on Earth. So these are the questions. These are the types of questions. I'm just going to present three, and I'm immediately going to turn it over to you. So as I promised, this is a short presentation, hopefully more interaction. The first question I asked was, when will we need a police officer? Now, it sounds kind of silly, but it, it actually makes sense. So we, let's say we go with the Mars One approach of four people arrive. And those four people are not specialists, but they're highly trained. They have backgrounds in um, a little bit of psychology, a little bit of geology, a little bit of planetary geology. They have a background in um, cooking and agriculture. All the things that are necessary to survive for those two years until the next four people arrive. And then there's 10 people, and then there's 20, and then there's 50, and then there's 100. When do we get to the point at which someone's behavior is such that those group of people cannot handle that behavior in and of themselves? That the system of peer, you know, peer collaboration or peer feedback breaks down and you have to bring someone in from the outside who represents the law. And that person now says, you've done something to harm someone else, and I have to bring in the law and create, and create a punishment scenario. So you can say, when does that happen? Does it happen at 20 people? Does it happen with the first four people? When does the marshal you know, have to arrive by interplanetary vehicle? And I don't have the answer for that. 
but it's a question. And so, is there something we can do proactively? And again, I don't have the answers, because this will be the, the source of my research and my project. Is there something we can do proactively to learn from our behavior here on Earth to say, well, there are ways to mitigate this. There are ways to proactively look to our propensity for the diversity of the complexity of human behavior and maybe preempt some of this and create systems that reduce that. Are, are the, the questions aren't rhetorical. You're looking for answers? Absolutely, the, absolutely. Right? I'll, I'll go through these three okay. if you don't mind and then yeah. we'll open it up if, if that's cool. Because otherwise we're going to get wonderfully distracted. I, I would appreciate that. But let me get through the other two. So the next question might be, when will we need a teacher? Now at first, it's, it's been stated, at least what I've heard from a number of the organizations that are looking at trying to get to Mars and establish, they don't really want people to have kids until we really understand the long-term ramifications of cosmic radiation, solar flares, and you know, reduced gravitational environments. I mean, those are all things that affect our physiology, our psychology. We're not sure what the ramifications are. Bringing a child to that world eventually will happen, we hope and believe, but we don't know when. But when that does happen, let's assume that that child or those children are raised in a homeschooled environment. I think that's a safe assumption. So then, when are there a large enough quantity of people who once again want to be specialized in what they do, that they say, it'd be nice if we had a teacher and we ship a teacher up to Mars. So now we're actually rewinding the clock back to the 1700s, the 1800s with one room classrooms. We have one teacher teaching from kindergarten through 12, from K through 12. Now, when does that break up again into segmented classes of different grades, different ages, maybe even different functional levels of ability within the classroom? So we say, okay, this is going to happen, but what can we learn from that? If we slow the process down and we work backwards and we say, when do we go from that first one room or from the homeschool to the first teacher, from the first teacher to the first one room classroom? to a high school and we work backwards, we can actually begin to look at, again, the examples of what we've done right and what we've done wrong or not as right here on Earth and hopefully learn from it. Now this one's a hard one. This one's, this one's one I'm going to throw at you just to open up the, open up the, the can of worms. And it, it makes everyone cringe inside, and, and so bear with me. If we go back to about 12 to 14,000 years ago, when we as a species were transitioning from hunter-gatherer societies to agrarian, we know from archaeological evidence and studies of current hunter-gatherer societies, the two or three that are left on, on the planet, that the family unit is not a husband, a wife, and child. The children do not reflect upon two people as being their dedicated parents. They don't even always know who their parents are, biological parents. The village raises the child, as Gandhi said. So in that respect, now there's, there's a much longer conversation here. And Jared Diamond is an expert um, presenter of some of these concepts. But as we transition from hunter-gatherer, which means a level, fairly level society in which everyone is capable of everything, similar to the first people who arrived to Mars, to that of an agrarian society where we have specialists. And that specialization comes from the ability to harbor resources, collect it, preserve it, distribute it. And that also gave rise to the family unit in which children and parents form an ability to maintain agricultural resources. What will happen on Mars? So let me present a case to you. We have four people on Mars, probably two women, two men, will probably be the first, the first set. What will be their relationship? Is it going to be two married couples? Is it realistic to believe that after seven months of being confined in a space the size of two Volkswagen vans, that they're actually going to maintain that marital status and not interact with each other? What happens when those four people have been alone on Mars for two years and the next four or 15 people arrive? My guess is it's going to be a Roman-style orgy. And bear with me for being a little bit bold, but I don't think we're going to maintain what we currently consider to be the social norm. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. It's not my place to judge. But I think for us to believe that the social systems we have in place here are going to continue and just, I think it's, I think it's a mistake to believe that. Again, I think we're going to rewind quite a ways back and go back to what might be, I would say, in our DNA, which is for more of a hunter-gatherer existence. And do we even need, again, big questions, especially now with what's happening in the US Congress, do we even need the traditional married family system? Is that even applicable for those first hundred years, those first few hundred years on Mars? Is that actually what benefits 
the society as a whole. So those are my first three questions. I have a bunch more that I've written up and some of them presented on my website. For the next year, I'm going to be asking these questions and then looking for data. Um, my actual functional masters will be much more data oriented. These are more the philosophical layers. The data is going to be more about allocation of resources, um, inbound protein and calories and output and such. So, but, but eventually I want to get to this down the road. So now I'd like to open it to you. Hopefully I've stimulated some thought. Starting with the first one. Sure, um, absolutely. I would think it would be, I, when you asked the question, I thought immediately of the historical American West. Can, can you hear him on your camera or no? Yeah, I can. You can? Okay, great. And when we had the kind of pioneering, pretty free form, rather unregulated pioneering of people who wanted to settle the American West, it, there was no astronaut screening process. We were not necessarily getting the best or the brightest. And so at some point, individual peer, or peer cooperation or, or efforts to, uh, to enforce some kind of behavioral norms broke down, probably when someone turned out to be a psychopath and a murderer and had to be curbed. So I would think in a Maybe in a more orderly society, the, the first highly screened astronauts or, or colonists, there might not be that problem uh, unless if someone went rogue, probably they, the rest of them could confine them or in some way limit them. I, maybe, maybe one model would be to have some kind of dispute or conflict resolution guidance or protocols and then a default or maybe an appeal initially her if, if they were willing she sits there in front of you and just waits and then gives the answer and then you have to wait 20 minutes to give your answer back so that would be very difficult for conflict resolution in that scenario given the breakdown in communication yes sir um i i think actually for conflict resolution uh, a format a longer format such as email is perfectly acceptable you don't have to have one-liner conversations back and forth that long time delay. Uh, I, I work in a large organization. My team is distributed all over the world. Uh, Ten minutes is optimistic. Um, but right. when things need to be resolved, we, we get it done. Right. Um, and it's uh, frequently kind of on a personal level, but it, it happens. It's not that hard. It's, done, it's happening now. Uh, distributed science teams, I'm sure, do this. I, I can't see scientists agreeing all the time. Right. Um, so what if one scientist were to murder another scientist? Well, over that would be some, considered bad. Over an affair or something. <laughs> <laughs> that would be bad. So, so let's say some scientist has an affair with another one. The guy goes crazy when he catches him. And bear with me, I'm playing Hollywood here. Kills him. And now we're going to be using, and I'm not criticizing your, your idea. I'm just saying now we're going to be using email or 20-minute delayed voice conversation with a psychologist or a, a, an official back on Earth. At some point, we have to bring somebody up. I think, to be that official, dedicated arbitrator, psychologist, law enforcement. Where you, have, where you have volunteerism or community, right. not to use a, it's a, vigilanteism has a bad name, but that's what happened in the old days before there were established law that's right. uh, frameworks. Interesting reference to the, um, to the Wild West. I, I recently, um, as a fallout to the most recent uh, shooting in, in, in the schools, um, schools or was in the movie theater last year, I think. Um, a friend of mine is, is a fairly strong gun advocate, and I try to listen to both sides and understand. And he brought up something I didn't know, is that Hollywood has created this very fictitious view of the Wild West, and that the number of guns carried open on the streets in the Wild West is actually a small fraction of the number we have today. And that the shootouts and the use of the individual vigilante with the gun to resolve issues has been completely exaggerated by Hollywood and that the towns were stable, secure, relatively safe, and there were only a few people who made history out of the tens of thousands of settlers, hundreds of thousands of, of people who actually lived in that environment. If that's true, and again, I'm just re relaying data that I was given as a story, if that's true, then maybe there is hope for that kind of um, environment. And in theory, if there aren't Martians, we shouldn't need guns on Mars. So <laughs> hopefully the propensity for that is reduced. Yes, yes sir. You have a question? Oh, oh, yeah. Well, um, yeah, so I think um, what we're missing in this discussion is that by the time we actually establish a colony on Mars, we will really have advancement in technology and, and in 
typically, you know, that time delay would be 20 minutes. It would be so if they advance maybe even maybe five minutes, one minute, because that's where with Moore's law. It, uh, that requires going faster than the speed of light, and, though. And, and then the second, yeah. second thing is, for example, um, for the teaching. Well, I think we'll be having tele education. You know, um, that's like telemedicine where it's going now. Definitely, um, we won't really be having human teachers at the very early stage of, of colonization. Mm -hmm. We'll be using tele. The tele so a lot of the, a lot of the material will be delivered. The cor the course curriculum, the classroom activities will be delivered electronically. No, we're using you know humans on one, on Earth or mm -hmm. wherever. If we have a colony of, on Luna Mars or something. But you'll actually have this interaction by the the you know the uh, internet mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, platform, but it will be face to face, you know, because of the you know the advancement in communications right. and so forth. So I think I think that's something to be considered. Okay. So I don't think we'd be going really back to the agrarian agra agra mm -hmm. agra culture. Well, again, I think I think the uh, the number one factor there is that we will have to invent some kind of quantum tunnel in communication to actually go faster than the speed of light in order to do that. So if that's possible, that'd be fantastic. Um, go ahead. Well, uh, in favor of going backwards, um, I, I think we've been all kind of avoiding uh, talking about it, but there's a good possibility that some of the early colonists of Mar Mars would be some kind of religious separatist group. Could be. And if they were, they sure wouldn't be importing teachers and policemen if they could help it. They would be uh, generating that stuff from within their group. They would, right. you know, form a conclave and sit in judgment of the bad evildoer. And right. um, they would try to produce their own teaching, although some religious fundamentalists groups do import teachers. Um, I think they would make a good effort to to be self-sufficient. Right. And that brings up an inc that brings up a huge question, which I didn't put up here because I thought I had enough twisters, but um, you know, do we need religion on Mars? How, what form will it take? Will it be a carry forward of what we have here on Earth? Um, or will it be a whole new, you know, a whole new realm of, of religion that we haven't seen here? Will it be the birth of a new concept there? Um, maybe the Messiah will be the first one to, to walk across Mars without a gas mask. You know, it's, it, it'll be interesting to see what unfolds and what happens. So it's, that's a good point. And that, as we've seen, the, the uh, British colonies, um, yeah, it's a bit of a stereotype, but the British colonies were founded in part, at least this, this continent, by um, people who were persecuted in their homeland and they left to start over somewhere else. And so if the money were gathered, if it becomes cost effective, perhaps we'll see that kind of migration again. Um, when I was talking to uh, Dr. Zubrin about this, um, and I'll this will be the last point, but I talked about to Dr. Zubrin and Jill about this just two weeks ago. Um, interesting little factoid, which I'm really just excited about chasing down more of these, is that at the time of the American Revolution, um, there were four times as many, there was four times as many people in Britain than there were in the United States, but four times as many universities in the United States, or what would become the United States, than there were in Britain. And that each time, historically, groups of people have broken off and created new colonies, there's an incredible acceleration of education, even, if I remember correctly, examples of vocabulary, a boost in vocabulary. And you go back and look at the writing of what were otherwise common folk at the time of the American Revolution, and their vocabulary was larger than what we have today by highly educated people. That there's, so there's this boost of activity, and then it slides down to a plateau, and some people would say we're now in a valley. And so maybe we'll see that same, and that's what science fiction writers have been writing about for, for decades, is that the humans break away from the Earth, go to another star, and they come back with incredibly advanced technologies. Um, and I would hope that that's true. I think that's exciting. Anything else? Have you enjoyed this? Has it been? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't ever think of these things. Now you'll ask all kinds of questions. Right. You know? I, some of the questions I've gone to are: um, Will we ever need recycling again? Why will we ever have a throwaway culture? Why will we ever have to transport food across? I mean, the whole system of food we have today is goes all the way back to World War II infrastructure of roads that we built for the military, so we could cross the country in three days. That allowed us to do transportation of foods which allowed, you know, when my mother was growing up in Iowa, they didn't have bananas. She had never seen a banana until she moved to California. And so you look at why would we ever create a system like that again when we could do local agriculture with 100% organic foods? Why would we ever go to internet foods again? There's all these questions you can ask 
and they're complex answers to relatively simple questions. And it's a lot of fun to take each segment of what we do today and what we take for granted and say, let's, let's not do that again. Let's do it better. Let's not go back to that. But we will. We're human. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, sir. Are you gonna, you, you've lost your image, but are you going to put up your website? Um, oh, yeah. Sorry, that was the... Yeah, uh, I, think this I think if you just touch the... If you just need to... Touch the thing control. It's interesting. Maybe not. Oh, the control's going to Oh, the control's going to No, what he's holding in his hand. I think the computer wants to see that. Yeah. There we go. Uh, okay, there we go. And so if you go to overthesun.com, um, and on the left-hand side, there's a button that says research. And uh, my company is a research and consulting organization. And this is my fourth research arena since uh, 2009. This will be the first one that I'm applying towards my own graduate work. The others were uh, investigations into um, mobile computing and international communications and, and fun stuff. So thank you, for everyone, for your interaction. I really appreciate the, uh, the feedback.